compassion. Literally, it means with suffering or suffer with. Compassion, the first of the five virtues that Paul tells the church in Colossae, which we might call megatown or megacity today, to put on like a new robe. Compassion. G.E. Farley says that it's the root of the primary indictment brought against the church by contemporary young critics, the failure to display compassion toward the poor or toward those who are different. John Philip Newell reminds us that the rebirthing of God requires us to connect with compassion and act accordingly. We have become so accustomed to seeing compassion as a duty, almost as a burden, that we fail to see it essentially as a benediction. That's what Nobel Prize, uh, Peace Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi says. And her vision of compassion from her Buddhist tradition is very enlightening. Suki describes compassion as requiring three things, the courage to see, the courage to feel, and the courage to act. First then is the courage to see, to see the connections between ourselves and others, to see the relationship that we share with literally everyone on earth. We are all brothers and sisters, we are all children of God. In our passage from Acts, Peter and John not only see the man asking for alms, they fix their eyes on him and tell him to look at us and pay close attention. Even the crowd saw what had happened. This text is rife with Greek synonyms for sight. Those of you that have exceptionally good eyes may be able to make those out on your bulletin covers this morning. Um, I'm sorry the image is so small, but underneath each of the sight words is the Greek word that it is in, the word that it is in Greek. So you can see there are many Greek words while we have multiple English words for the same thing. Now, why is this text so full of Greek synonyms for sight? Well, because compassion begins in having the courage to see. Now, maybe you're familiar with Amanda Palmer. She's the poster woman for the musical subgenre of dark cabaret. Yes, that's a thing. Uh, from her time sir, singing in the duo The Dresden Dolls. She's an activist, protesting on behalf of those whose voices are lost or ignored. And before becoming the first artist to bring in over a million dollars in crowdfunding for her latest album, she was a street performer. I'm going to quote now from her 2013 TED Talk, which I encourage you to watch yourself. Uh, I'm going to link to it on Facebook and on SoundCloud and in YouTube, wherever you're watching this or listening. Look for that link. It'll be there. She says, I was a self-employed living statue called the Eight-Foot Bride. I painted myself white one day, stood on a box, put a hat or can at my feet, and when someone came by and dropped in money, I handed them a flower and some intense eye contact. And if they didn't take the flower, I threw in a gesture of sadness and longing as they walked away. So I had the most profound encounters with people, especially lonely people who looked like they hadn't talked to anyone in weeks. And we would get this beautiful moment of prolonged eye contact being allowed in a city street, and we would sort of fall in love a little bit. And my eyes would say, thank you, I see you. And their eyes would say, nobody ever sees me, thank you. Palmer had the courage to see and encouraged others to see also. Something as simple as looking into the eyes of people in a public place became an act of compassion. When seeing someone, connecting with them is not commonplace, we cannot call ourselves a compassionate society. We have to see in order to be compassionate. So the rebirthing of God in compassion begins with having the courage to see. The courage to see. The courage to feel. Aung San Suu Kyi, embodies the courage to feel in her life. She's from Myanmar, formerly called Burma, 
and was placed under house arrest by the brutal military dictatorship, the junta, for over 25 years. 25 years in house arrest. Despite the terrible conditions led by the repressive regime, she still had the courage to feel compassion for the leaders of this military dictatorship. If I had really started hating my captors, she says, I would have defeated myself. Suki avoids hatred by having the courage to feel, not to forget, to, for, to not forget that she has a relationship with them. In the case of the leadership here, they are soldiers, and her father was also a soldier who led Burma's fight against British colonial rule and later Japanese occupation. And though her father was assassinated when she was only two years old, she remembers still being held by his soldiers. She says, you are not frightened of people whom you do not hate. It is that straightforward. You are not frightened of people whom you do not hate. John Philip Newell takes this a step further. He writes, Suki teaches that the greatest obstacle to compassion is not hatred. It is habitual patterns of narrow self-interest. It is a way of seeing in which we pretend that we can be well simply by looking after ourselves. Or we pretend that our nation can be safe simply by focusing on the protection of our nation, even at the expense of other nations. Such patterns of narrow self-interest become the norm, accepted and sanctioned at, all ti at times, even by our religious traditions. Now Paul, Paul saw, saw these patterns of narrow self-interest in the church at Colossae. He wrote them a letter decrying their patterns of fusing pagan and Judaic belief in ways that worked against the community, worshiping angels as intermediaries to God, keeping knowledge and wisdom hidden, keeping it separate, and if you knew something, you kept it to yourself. In fact, Colossae may be the origin point for the Gnostic beliefs, those beliefs about knowledge of God being better than sharing that knowledge with each other, among other things. Paul decried these corruptions, the Gnostic corruption, and wrote back ways in which to genuinely be the body of Christ. Clothe yourselves with a holy way of life, he writes, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and yes, patience. Put up with one another. I love this. Put up with one another. This is the first step we've got to put up with. That's tolerance. But beyond tolerance, putting up with each other is forgiveness and pardoning. We go one step further each step of the way. Forgive, pardon any offenses against one another as the Lord has pardoned you. Because you should act in kind. But above all else, put on love. Love is the perfect tie to bind these together. Clothe yourselves with compassion. The first virtue that people see is compassion. Choose to feel connected with everyone just as everyone can perceive what you're wearing. Everyone can perceive what you're wearing. Let them perceive compassion first. Love may be the tie between them all, but compassion is key. Now, forgiveness, how can you show compassion to someone you hold a grudge against? Forgiving, pardoning offenses is incredibly difficult, but incredibly important. It reconnects us, helps us to have the courage to feel, the courage to see, the courage to feel, the courage to act. Compassion is not just about seeing a need and sending out your heart to those who suffer. It's about acting to end that suffering or share in it. In the rather aptly named book of Acts of the Apostles, Peter and John do not just see the man asking for alms outside the temple. They act. Peter offers healing, knitting up the very bones of the man's ankle and foot and raises him up. Th that part, the miracle, is very difficult to imagine today and at the time even would have been more than enough just the healing alone. It would have been enough. But Peter and John go further. They walk with the man into the temple. 
The act of physical healing is accompanied by spiritual healing. Reconnection to God and reconnection to the community of believers. Note that the crowds don't recognize him as a fellow believer, as someone from the community. No, they say, that's the guy who used to beg outside the temple. His entire identity to them is as a beggar. And yet, now, he is literally on the inside. He's literally brought from being an outsider to being an insider, participating fully in worship in the temple. This is the first act after Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples and the crowds gathered around them. The first thing, reconciliation, healing, acts of compassion. Yet, it's overwhelming to try to follow this example. There's so much pain, so much suffering, that it makes us want to shrink up into a tiny, protected little ball. Aung San Suu Kyi describes this well. She talks about a, a pressure cooker left too long on the stove. Yeah, one of those unsafe earlier models that's on the stove here. Uh, the pressure cooker, once filled with delicious food, let's say soup or beans or something of the like, explodes. And that soup goes all over everything, a tomato soup. You can just see the floors turning red, the ceiling being covered in Soup that starts to drip down, even the walls, and it's sticking to those walls something fierce. The mess is terrible. Can you imagine standing there, seeing the mess, feeling terrible about it? Suki offers this advice. Don't just stand there despairing. Do something. Just continue to do what you believe is right. Later on, the fruits of what you do will become apparent on their own. Do something. Just starting to clean up the mess makes a big difference. You might clean the stove off, be able to cook a meal. Even if the rest of the kitchen is still nasty, you've got somewhere clean. Maybe you're cleaning the door to help other people come in to help you. That's also a good thing. Just do something wherever you start. It's a good place to start. As long as you're doing what is right. Yes, there's a huge mess in the world. Yes, there's lots of suffering and there's lots of need for compassion in the world. But as Amanda Palmer demonstrated, merely looking someone in the eyes can be an act of compassion. Compassion. The courage to see, the courage to feel, the courage to act. I'd like to end the message today with another personal story of compassion. This one was shared initially on Reddit and later on Facebook by the group Love What Matters. It's not my story, but it is someone's story, an anonymous person. I was day tripping from Vancouver I'm sorry, to Vancouver from Seattle, and stopped in for lunch at a little cafe. From my window, I saw a young teenage girl out in the cold, squatted down in a closed-up doorway, holding a small bundle in her arms. She was panhandling. People were mostly walking by, ignoring her. She looked just broken. I finished up my meal and went outside, went through my wallet, and thought I'd give her $5 for some food. I got up to her, and she was sobbing. She looked like she was 14 or 15. And that bundle in her arms was a baby wrapped up. It felt like I just got punched in the chest. She looked up, putting on a game face, and asked me if I had any change. I asked her if she'd like some lunch. Right next door was a small, quick-trip type grocery store. I got a can of formula for the baby, very young, maybe two or three months old, and took her back to the cafe, though I'd just eaten. She was very thankful, got a burger and just inhaled it, got her some pie and some ice cream. She opened up and we talked. She was 15, got pregnant, her parents were angry and she was fighting with them. She ran away. She'd been gone almost one full year. I asked her if she'd like to go home and she got silent. I coaxed her. She said her parents wouldn't want her back. I coaxed her further, and she admitted that she stole $5,000 in cash from her dad. Turns out $5,000 doesn't last a long time at all, 
and the streets are tough on a 15-year-old. Very tough. She did, she did want to go back, but she was afraid no one wanted her back after what she did. We talked more. I wanted her to use my phone to call home, but she wouldn't. I told her I'd call and see if her folks wanted to talk to her. She hesitated, gave bad excuses, and finally, eventually agreed. She dialed the number and I took the phone. Her mom picked up and I said, hello. Awkwardly, I introduced myself and said her daughter would like to speak to her. Silence and I heard crying. I gave the phone to the girl and she was just quiet, listening to her mom cry and then said, hello. And she cried. They talked. She gave the phone back to me. I talked to her mom some more. I drove her down to the bus station and bought her a bus ticket home. Gave her $100 cash for incidentals and some formula, diapers, wipes, snacks for the road. Go, got to the bus and she just cried, saying thank you over and over again. I gave her a kiss on the forehead and a hug. Kissed her baby and she got on the bus. I get a Christmas card from her every year. She's 21 now and in college. The courage to see. The courage to feel. The courage to act. What a beautiful world it is, even covered in soup. What a task before us to put on compassion, to act in faith and love in the world. What a savior to lead us, anointing as he was anointed. Showing compassion, having compassion, as those didn't have compassion for him. And yet he empowered the disciples to heal and reconnect with the world. And us as well. May you see through the eyes of the Holy One. May you feel through the heart of the Holy Spirit. May you act through the body of the Holy Christ. Amen. <laughs>